there are two or three different pillars that I will sort of uh, describe, and then we'll see how a house is built on those three. First and foremost is globally, there is a there is no longer a debate about the fact that greenhouse gas emission is not good for sustainability of our future generations. We need to act now to ensure that there is a protected future for the incoming generations. And on that, there is no longer a debate. I think there was a period of time when people were debating, saying, does it really matter? And, you know, is this really the cause and things like that? But I think that's no longer the debate. Everybody now agrees uniformly. There's enough scientific evidence to show that uh, greenhouse gas emission uh, is something that we uh, and the changes that the greenhouse gas emission accumulation uh, in, in increasing concentration in our atmosphere will bring is irreversible. Okay, uh, we've, we've all seen in last 18 months, the whole globe has seen what happens when a pandemic strikes and we don't have a vaccine. Now with that you discovered vaccine, there's high of relief, but we're, we're still undergoing that whole process of, you know, making the world uh, a safer place. The problem is that for the climate change, there is no vaccine. So once you have sort of reversed the climate or created the climate change, uh, there is no such human action and that could actually then lead to a reversal of that. I mean, that's the problem. Uh, so that's the one clear understanding across the globe, across the political leadership, across the economic leadership, social leadership. This is one criteria that is clearly understood. So that's become one. Two, I think globe is increasingly a very dynamic place in terms of the the, the geopolitical alliances, the, the military forces, the economic interests. They are all aligning very differently than year, uh, you know, a world of yesteryears when essentially there were two a couple of blocks and you're a member of one of the blocks and your interests would get taken care of. I think that's no longer the case. It's a very dynamic place. Uh, national interests are aligned very differently. So governments are also looking at policy formulation within their own boundaries to protect the interests and people are giving different names on you know, nationalism and, and you know, uh, get, getting closing out your borders. But I think it's, it's much bigger than that. I think it's about governments uh, understanding their responsibility about protecting their uh, basic, uh, their, their, uh, their constituency, if I can use that word, uh, through a set of actions. The third thing is, Ultimately, God has not given or the nature has not given the same resources to everybody across the world, right? Different geographies have different resources at their disposal. For example, Middle East is abundant on crude oil. We are not. Okay. Uh, there is uh, there is a new found uh, shale oil uh, discovery in United States. We don't have shale oil. Well, right. even if we have and we do find is not enough in its quantity to meet the energy demands of our economy. We are a fast growing developing country. So if we look at it from those perspectives, uh, but what has nature given us then? We have we don't have food oil, we don't have natural gas. So what do we have? We have it in, but we don't have enough quantity. Then. But we are an agrarian economy. God has gifted us sun, which is not gifted to many economies in the world. So sun is the gift to us. Sunshine is uh, our, our, our geography receives a fair share of sunshine. We are an agrarian economy. There is water, so we our resources are more agriculture based. So, if there is a technology uh, that is available that can bridge this divide from, I don't have the crude oil, but I need energy. I have agrarian economy, so I have a lot of agriculture based products, whether in form of a waste or in form of an output. And can I bridge this divide in a, in a very structured form through technology to uh, drive my ultimate goal of providing affordable and clean energy to my uh, countrymen? And I think it is this all these factors coming together which has led to this new font push for uh, biofuels. Because very clearly, your feedstock is in your country. If you're an agrarian country, you are continuously and in a recycled. Uh, form uh, and on a continuous basis, very sustainable basis, it keeps coming back. It is it is another form of solar energy that you could use. Uh, and and you can use technology today, which companies like Class provide to actually create this uh, bridge of biofuels. And even as we transit to a different uh, era of energy usage, I think we will not be able to jump from just crude oil directly to some other form of energy 
it, there will be a bridge in between. Like biofuels providing that bridge because it, it creates income farmers, it, uh, it addresses the DNG problem, uh, it uses the existing infrastructure, it is foreign exchange saver for the producer uh, country, which is us in, in this particular case. It enhances our energy security to the extent. So I think all stakeholders in this case, whether you are a farmer or you are a rental officer or you are a vehicle uh, user uh, or owner, all of them benefit in one way or another. And of course, there is also greater good for everybody. So I think all of that actually uh, has come together in a in a nice uh, way. All these have uh, sort of converged in a very very positive uh, way, and that is what is leading to the current situation. Sure. So no, thanks, Shishi. But you know, I guess uh, one of the things is that also the policies of this government over the last two years on this have been pretty practical in the sense that they are leading to action. So maybe you can, if you can, you know, things like interest subvention that they did, or even just E20 going to E20 over a period of time, phase wise, and so on. And even Niti Ayo came up with a paper which is very interesting on this. So maybe if you can kind of summarize what all, how has it changed over the last two years? Yes, I think very, very clearly there is a convergence of thought. And I think that's very critical to any policy formulation. And we are seeing some very progressive work done over the last two years um, uh, by the policymakers. Um, there's a clear uh, creation, and I, I always believe if we create a conducive ecosystem, then things will strive. Uh, and if you look at it from any dimensions, you know, you look at it just not too long ago in this country. In fact, when I came to Braj, there was one feedstock called Molasses C. Uh, there was, uh, in, that was permitted in the country, there were three states where 85% of the ethanol was being produced. But, um, and there was essentially one, um, sector of the industry called sugar, which was the natural owner of uh, an ethanol plant because they had the piece of it. And uh, just, just 24 months down the line, 36 months down the line from the time I joined, we have a completely different picture today where A is no longer one to three, three one feedstock for sugar mill themselves. Now they are free to use any, they can directly take a sugar cane and produce ethanol directly without going the sugar. Uh, so there are three fish stocks for them. There are three price points for them. Uh, there's a five year visibility of uh, buying uh, of, uh, quantities from the oil marketing companies. So you know that there's a market out there. There's a buyer out there. So if I produce ethanol, I'll be able to sell. The pricing points are also declared. The policies are also very conducive. The GST regime that came in also has allowed interstate movement. Uh, on the Then the grain uh, thing came where uh, that freed up a completely different, uh, that com fundamentally changed the industry sector as well. I see it because from a single industry with the sugar, it is now possible for anybody to uh, put up a plant because grain is no longer um, captive to a particular process, right? It is uh, available freely to FCI go down to market mechanisms. So we are seeing a lot of ESG funds, uh, steel companies, uh, solar developers, wind, mark, uh, wind park developers, all of them. Um, auto component makers, I mean, or it's, it's, it's taken a very variety of uh, industrialists now to start looking at ethanol as a very positive story. Uh, and therefore, it and now with grain, you can literally produce it anywhere in India. You don't have to produce it only in these three states. So geographically, the whole country is now your uh, operating place. Uh, right. not states, multiple feedstocks, multiple industry sector. And then around all these, Enabling factors like what you were mentioning, the interest subvention scheme, the, the tripartite um, uh, mechanism for uh, <clears throat> which was announced by the government between the oil marketing company, uh, ethanol uh, producer, uh, uh, and uh, <clears throat> to, to ensure that there's an escrow account mechanism that is created, which then allows you to uh, go ahead and uh, with the bank to create a project uh, funding mechanism that is very sustainable. Oh, then we came to some other policies. So what has been really encouraging for me is many times a central policy is decided, right? But the enabling policies don't come along. In this particular case, we have seen host of enabling policies and even till today they keep uh, moving positively, the involvement of states uh, into the whole uh, equation, which was not the case earlier, um, uh, the involvement of banks uh, to, to drive the, whole, the way the whole pollution um, uh, approval process is being streamlined, the EC clearances uh, process that has been streamlined, 
I think from every single dimension, that's what I call the enabling policies, have all been uh, worked upon, thought through, and being rolled out. So very clearly, the message is that this is not a policy which is made. This is a policy that needs to work. Sure. Yeah, and and I think we have all the whatever meetings that I attended uh, in my capacity as CIA uh, uh, committee member and uh, co-chair as a technology provider. We have only seen a positive uh, information. How to make things happen? What are the impediments? How can we remove that? Okay, and I think this is this is great because not one policy, which was the national biofuel policy that came around, but all the enabling policies around that to make that into a reality. I think that is the biggest change that I see. Sure. But are you seeing any pushback from any side, like a state, like a Chhattisgarh said, rice is. You know, we won't want to do rice and stuff like that. You know, are you seeing that as anything is slightly bigger, or is that you think everybody there's a buy-in from everyone on this one? I think so two or three dimensions. As I said there are clear buy-ins for a clear understanding that look, lot of our actions that we're doing today will also protect our future, and I think that's a good good understanding now with the people. Nobody's contesting that. Right. Number two, there is a clear policy that you see rolled out. Number three, you're saying what does this do, and then let. And I'm going to get a little granular and sorry for that, but you look at it like this. A small farmer in Chhattisgarh today gets an outlet for his, not only for his rice, which he probably goes through a market mechanism, but unless at the end of the day, we all know from the principal economy that unless there are multiple uses for the same crop, how are you going to protect his income? He cannot protect that income all the time through what I would call a subsidy barriers. That will, at one fine day, they will stop. So if you create a process by which his income goes up, but not because the MSP went up, but income goes up because there are multiple income sources for him now. And, and I'll give an example. So today, when there's a straw standing in his field, he torches it, right? That's what he does. Right. Yeah. I'm willing to pay him 1500 bucks a ton if he delivers it. Whether right. it's a second, an ethanol plant, whether it's a CBG plant, uh, even the, on the other sides of the energy equation that we have talked about, of course, and I, I'm not going to do the thermal energy, but there are a lot of uses that has been found. But bioenergy is clearly an aspect in which it enables you to increase farmers' income. You protect the environment, which is great. Okay, uh, you you are providing a feedstock sustainability to convert it into a usable form of energy because rice straw by itself is not in usable form. So we need to find it into convert it into usable form of energy, whether gas or liquid. And that is what the technology does. That's where we play. And as you start to move forward, and this is this is just amazing. This is so. Let us say I, I start to convert that feedstock into an end product, and there are byproduct streams. Okay, I create a large quantity of solid fertilizer that goes back to the field. I create a large quantity of liquid fertilizer that goes back to the field. Okay, I create other byproducts which are biologically. Biological substitutes for, I mean, something as basic as bitumen that comes out of a refinery. We now have bio bitumen solution available. So, practically speaking, we are transforming an uh, our uh, hydrocarbon based economies, which is what the world is all about, to a carbohydrate based economy. Right. And that's the big question. Sure. And everybody is supporting. Sure. So, okay, great. So we have a, so let's say the first big thing is done, which is policy and it's all well done and well. Let's understand the economics of this whole process, because ultimately if economics doesn't work, this is not going to work. So I'll, I'll break it up into three, four parts. So first part is the ROI itself, right? So if, if I am a grain producer or sorry, a ethanol producer using grain or sugar, what are the ROIs looking like right now? At least because I guess right now they're good, but what do you think, you know, today and over a longer period, what kind of ROIs do you think how profitable it is to make ethanol? Yeah, so I think that's where I would connect it to my earlier answer also, that if I'm a producer, I need to look at it from a little long-term perspective and not only from a, a financial number alone, because that is also considering several risks that would reside in the business. Right? So first and foremost, there's a five-year visibility of purchase, which is very good. For the five years, you know that my product, if I produce, it will be purchased at following rates by the all marketing companies, whatever the rates are there. Government has clearly signaled that this is no connection to the crude oil prices, none whatsoever. 
whether the crude price is low or high, the price of ethanol in India gets decided based on the feedstock prices that farmer gets. Okay, consideration for him, the basic feedstock. So that's the second part, and I think it's very innovatively done. We have uh, a different price point depending on different feedstock that you uh, use. So I think that's extremely innovative. So so that's the, that's the uh, second part. Now, if 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 we look at it from from those dimensions and start uh, building the bridge back to uh, what you were asking, where is it that we see the convergence of this whole thing from a producer's perspective? And the producer is saying, okay, when I go and prepare my project report, what does the error look like? Well, that's where it, everything starts, right? Yeah. And depending on different factors of how far away from the feedstock you are or how far away from blending point you are, what's the logistic situation and the land and the water and the energy and all those costs. But if I, we are, we are still looking at whether it is rain-based, whether it is sugar-based, we are looking at project IRRs in excess of 25%, very safe. And just, I mean, in some cases, it can even go to 35%. Right. But 25% is a base given. But how many projects today you can put up a 25% RR with absolute visibility of five years of marketing of your end product? Right. Which is environmentally friendly. I mean, this is, this is great business to be right now. Sure. Okay. So that's great. And you know, let's break it up also in the demand and supply side of the, the whole thing. So demand obviously will come from autos. That's the main thing. But how ready is the auto industry today? And what is the incentive for an auto company, to, unless it is pushed by the government to say that, you know what, you have to make vehicles which are E20 or compliant and so on. What is it for the auto industry to do this? Uh, yes, Sanjeev, great question. So I always say that uh, if, if, there's a, if there's a lesson somewhere in the world which we can learn from, we should very quickly adopt it. We should not have any hesitation in adopting a lesson. And if you look at what, uh, what happened in Brazil or what's already happening in Brazil, they have a policy, uh, they have rolled out a program by which over the next 10 years, they would like to be completely free from hydrocarbons, completely free in their energy. It's, they don't want Okay, now that's a big step forward. Now, what are they saying therefore that they'll go to biofuels and they have a huge role to play. Now, a country which is declared like that, which has led the world in showing the way of what biofuels can do to the economy. Uh, just before the pandemic struck, there was the India Brazil conference in Delhi, and that we were attending, and there were all the senior guys from Brazil uh, industry as well. And they presented a paper to show that 20, up to 27% blending of ethanol, they have not found any significant performance change in an IC engine. Some, but no significant. If you look at it from India's perspective, then uh, of course government will have to. And but what happened in Brazil? The government demanded flex fuel vehicles. You needed flex fuel vehicles in Brazil to operate. So you can go to a pump. You can choose what you want to fill into your car. What blend, zero percent, hundred percent, and everything in between is available, and it's available at different price points. How conscious you are, how comfortable you are. What is it that you want your vehicle to do? Many dimensions that actually decide the choice of your fuel. Here also, I think we already heard there's a consideration going on right now to introduce flex fuel vehicles in the country. The technology already exists, by the way. I mean, so there's no new research is required. It's already there in Brazil. Uh, then we go to the second point: is what happens to the existing vehicles? Right? Yeah. So. Because that number is far larger than the new getting it. So if you are in Assam today, chance is that you are driving a vehicle on pure petrol. The same car you drive in Maharashtra, I'm driving a 12% blend, and I don't know the difference as a user. Why? Because up to a certain point in time, because you, you understand that ethanol is an oxygenating agent, so it releases oxygen, which is very good for combustion. So it actually aids combustion. Of, a, of the fuel, it reduces the particulate matter, it reduces the emission, it is CO2 friendly. So it is it's great on the entire environmental dimension of a fuel combustion system. What it also requires, I think beyond 15% of blending, what we call for is the rubber components in the fuel train of a vehicle will have to undergo change in the sense that they will they will fail if you keep replacing them with the normal ones. So this is special. You need a slightly different composition along the fuel train path, so gaskets and 
uh, fields is what we'll have to change, which is not a big expense. By the way, just so, so just so that I could put some numbers out for you. So for a typical car in India, this would probably cost for an existing car maybe about three thousand rupees. If you go to a flex fuel vehicle, that is, I buy a completely new flex fuel vehicle. How much more will I pay? Maybe I'll pay three to four percent higher price in the car. Okay, we are talking about uh, giving subsidies to electric vehicles, right? This is four percent more. Would we can government can even? I'm not saying that they're considering or not, but they can even consider saying, "All right, I'll give you four percent waiver on the tax side, right? So then any heavily taxed uh, commodity, right? Why? Because this is a step. And I, I must. I ask this question to every uh, group, especially in the physical world. When we used to have this meeting, I asked, "How much? How many of you will pay four percent more for a car? Whichever car you want to buy." If I tell you that by buying that, you will actually protect the future of your great grandchildren. Everybody will say yes. So we are not looking at some huge uh, tectonic shifts in technology or in cost levels or in ownership costs. Nothing of this. I'm saying pay a little bit today to protect the future for your grandchildren tomorrow. All of us will do that. I mean, it's a one-time cost. And after right. that, it's a matter of so that's one. Two, from auto auto industry's perspective. I think what if I'm a designer of an IC engine, I would like to know from the government, and this is what they have been asking that please tell me the fuel. Once you tell me the fuel, I will design my engine for that. Okay. Sure. Ethanol will permit me to go to higher compression ratios and therefore get the best out of the vehicle. So today also, if I go to an E20 pump and fill it into my car, will my car run? Yes, it will run. Mm. It, but if I design it for E20, it will run better. Sure. So that's the difference. So I think EVs, uh, the, the vehicle makers will also, but what is important is for them to understand that there is a possibility that so maybe in two years time frame, I will get a minimum fuel of E10 across the country or E12 across the country, or E15 as the case may be. And then it will go to E20. Then they can design their vehicles to maximally leverage the good properties of ethanol when it's blended. Otherwise, you're not utilizing them to the full and to that extent you may lose some benefit uh, as a designer of the vehicle. So that's the perspective. The third perspective, I think that's very critical for us to understand. And I, I don't know whether I'll get time in this talk further. So I will. So there's a lot of passion or a fight about EV right now. And I say this, EVs are not for India as much as they are for a non-agrarian economy. Because for me to guarantee that my electricity will come out of non-fossil sources, so India is still coal-based power. Last we are doing great work on improving the share of solar and wind, but they have their own, uh, you know, force of growth. Yeah, uh, we still remain coal-based power, and then it defeats the whole purpose around the environment. Right? We don't have an infrastructure. We don't have infrastructure uh, uh, of having electricity available 24/7 uninterrupted across the country. We don't have it. Yeah. So we are still at a stage, different stage. Uh, and I think that is what is important that as we start to grow as an economy, but agrarian, I have all of it. Most important, IC engine still remain the IC engine. Most important, 17,000 parts per car still remain 17,000 parts per car. By the way, in electric car, the parts are only 700. So that's the big difference. So it creates employment of over 10 million people. We are a young country. We are people getting younger by the day. I need to create employment opportunities for my people. Having said that, Electric vehicles will have their own space in the economy, uh, and they will also there will be a space, and let them be. I don't think one should envy that. Let it be. There will be a space for. It. But biofuels do not ask us to change anything. Just ask us to change our consciousness. Right. That's easier. To do. That's true. Yeah, that's very yeah. well put. So, but you talking about agrarian economy. You know, one of the articles recently, I think one of the newspapers carried that. Can India really afford to have biofuels with, you know, a hungry population or something like that? You know, some to some that effect. You know, so in terms of what's your take on this? In you know, is this you know? I thought, you know, it was we are also talking about a lot of wastage on one side, and FCI has a lot of storage. And so where where do we stand here in terms of you know? And especially if you look at the next five years, what the plan of you know, Niti Aayog or you know your plan is. So I think I think what is important is some facts, and I'm only stating some facts. So we are the number two agriculture producer in the world. We are not a small agriculture producer. We are a very large producer of 
agriculture commodities in the world. Number two, if we take our average production of last four years and also the projected projection for next year, then I can stay with what is already there. The last four is already available on record. And we then say, all right, whatever I produced, and then I assume I will have three year drought. That's what should never happen to my country. Three year of continuous drought, one year after another for three years. And I say that I need 15% more of grains. I'm still left the surplus after all these calculations. Right. All right. So therefore, so let's understand that A. So two, I don't think anybody should go hungry. Why should any human being go hungry? Okay. okay. But that's a very different question uh, or a problem to solve. That's about reaching the food to them. That's about enabling them to get the food. That's a very different cup of uh, uh, supply chain problem to be solved compared to what use we put it to. If I take the grain and put it to energy use, yes, by all means, it's a wrong thing. But we're not saying that. We're saying all the food that I need, plus three years of drought in the economy, plus 15%, I'm still surplus. What do I do? Because that surplus goes waste because it was it does not even fit for human consumption. Yeah. So what's not fit for human consumption? What's local? What's not good? What's surely excess? Mm. Yeah. That how can put it to a good use? In fact, that extra income probably is good for farmers too yes, in a drought year, drought year as well, right? So for everybody, let's understand yeah. that it's good for everybody. Yeah. yeah. And then we all, at the end of the day, we want our economy to do well. And in India, the economy will do well when rural folks do well. It's not right. going to be forced so much. So sure. it's a very positive stroke for the economy. We are putting mm. what we have to produce. Right, okay. Countries are selling crude oil because that's what they have. Correct. Right. We have this. Let's use this. There is technology available. It's good for all stakeholders. It's good for future. Why would I not? Right. Mm -hmm. that, that's a great point. So, so okay. So, let's look at the ethanol economy and you as a company over the next five years. And I'm not talking about what's happening next quarter. But how are you positioned to kind of benefit from this, and what kind of what are you guys doing on this, sir? That, that's a fantastic question, Sanjeev. You know, because if you really look at it from where from where we stand today, we see a very long and a very clear pathway for development of bioeconomy. For many years, the talk has been only around ethanol and what happens with it. But ethanol is so if I were to tell you that ethanol is like a brick. Because that is something that all of us will understand. I can take a brick and do many things with it, right? I can build a house, I can build a dam, I can build um, a commercial building, I can build a temple. It, it's, it's left to my imagination, but the brick remains brick. Ethanol is like the brick in the world of chemistry. It's one of the, there are three bricks. This is one of them, which is very, 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 very versatile molecule that you can actually integrate it to many dimensions. Uh, and if you build on that further, so what have we done? So if you look at our platform of biomobility, bio what have we said? Use of low carbon intensity fuels for uh, driving for the purpose of mobility. But mobility is across three uh, surfaces, right? The road, that is what we are addressing right now. Air, which is about all about sustainable aviation fuels. And then marine, which is on the water, which is about marine biofuels. And right now with ethanol, we are only, as I would call it, scratching the surface in the, and no pun intended, scratching the surface of the uh, movement on the road. And earth. we're not talking about air, we're still not talking about uh, water. So the next natural iteration is to go to that path and sustainable aviation fuel is the very definitive path forward for the airline industry. For the simple fact that I don't see aircraft going electric in pretty soon. That's right. burning. And for if they have to so solve the CO2 problem, sustainable aviation fuel is a definitive uh, solution for them because the good news on sustainable aviation fuel is our technology and other technologies as well. We produce what is called as drop in fuel, that means the same molecule as uh, the conventional uh, turbine, aviation turbine fuel. So it's not substitute or equivalent, it is same. Mm. It comes from a different route, but it is exactly the same. And therefore, adaptation into the technologies because it's the same aircraft, you do no change for the same fuel. It just came from a different route. 
right? And therefore, it is uh, more CO2 friendly. So, so that's one part. So, on the energy side itself, there is a lot more explorations to be done across the three uh, modes of transport: air, surface, and uh, marine. If you look at it from a different perspective, this can also iterate to if you if you look at a typical refinery, we all grown up uh, seeing refineries from the crude oil. They don't only produce uh, energy products; they also have downstream uh, uh, products, uh, which plastics, uh, you know, uh, other chemicals, performance chemicals. So there are many dimensions to specialty chemicals to which the downstream production. Uh, you can do practically everything that you can do on the crude oil, also on the bio route. So the, a lot of technological development is now happening on that side. Plastics is a very big frontier to be overcome by us in our lifetime. Okay, that needs to get solved because otherwise they'll become a unsurmountable problem. So bioplastics, biodegradable plastics are clear answers that uh, are being worked upon right now. So that's another area. We also see a complete, not a complete, but a very significant change in the way we are thinking about our resources. Okay, um, and when I say we, is, I'm talking of my friends from the industry. Um, water has become a very important resource for everybody, and we are increasingly more conscious about. So, and this was a, this was a dialogue that used to have. Been, water was very cheap everywhere in the world, and therefore people were not preserving it. Okay, because it had, oh, there is no ROI on that investment. You ask me to recover water, there is no ROI. But now the dialogue has changed. Now people are understanding what is the cost of not having the water. Am I audible? Hello? Hello? Am I audible? Yes, sir, you are. Yes, sir, yes, sir you are audible. Right. I think Sanjay, Sanjay okay. has some problem. Okay. I'm just checking. So, Water preservation is another big area. Zero liquid discharge will become norm as we move forward. So that's another big area of business for us. Yeah. Fermentation is at the core of pride, right? Whatever we do is around fermentation. And we see fermentation to cut across three very big verticals as we move forward. One is the food, fermented food, and there's going to be increasing role of fermented food in our lives. The second one is about uh, fermentation role in medicines. So biopharma and society. And the third one is role of fermentation in energy and chemicals. So there's a very clear pathway that we see forward where our core competence can be put to different uses and leverage that for the good of the company, of course, for the good of humankind as well. And therefore, we find ourselves all our other so whether it is bioenergy, whether it is ethanol, whether it is biogas, whether it is second generation ethanol, those are different forms of technological solutions. But fundamentally, Bioenergy is uh, finding a big traction. We are also seeing a big evolution taking place on moving away from using the ethanol as a basic brick concept and you know, sort of uh, uh, leading the evolution to different product lines. Fermentation as a very basic technology that takes us forward. And as we do all this, I think increasing um, what I would call as understanding on the part of the customers as well as us is pushing us to create solutions uh, the carbon intensity reduction program that we find a big worldwide as we move forward, and that is in very short time. Uh, over the next 18 to 24 months, I think we will witness a big change happening where companies will seek carbon intensity reduction programs for solutions from the technology providers, and we will be at the forefront at that time. So, carbon intensity reduction, big driver. Uh, increasing, continuously increasing use of biofuels is a big driver. Continuously evolving, uh, evolving uh, space around ethanol as a basic building block, and then all around that another big one. zero liquid discharge that I mentioned. So, from that perspective, we think that we have a very clear and uh, very visible road ahead, which is very very challenging and yet very exciting. So, compared to last ten years, where you know there was kind of the runway seemed pretty limited, as you said, because of you know just sugar based ethanol being the main driver you are seeing that next 10 years could be very very exciting yes uh, having said that that you know future is and i think it's a good idea good point to be at when future looks very very exciting but when i but I, as we all know the driving uh, is something where you also have to look into rear view mirror once in a while uh, <laughs> to be a good driver 
And uh, the most important fact for me is that for a company uh, of our size, uh, he and our founders, uh, the credit goes to founders and all of my team members who have served in this company for a very long period of time. That they never, never gave up on their vision and passion. Even when things were very difficult, they still stayed committed to the cause saying, no, one fine day, the world will have to see this viewpoint. That this is the right way to progress and not a shortcut. And I think that commitment, that passion, that ethos, that resilience that has got built into the company is what will take us forward. Because we are just not, so we are very, very, we are reasonably well prepared for this, this, this opportunity. Of course, as, as things go one fold, we'll have to do other things as well. But fundamentally, the resilience, the passion, the commitment, the DNA of the company is already casted. It's casted over the last 35 years of very, very strong, committed hard work. That yeah. is what is that is what is making possible to come and speak with you guys today. But I, I just want to make sure that that is it is that and that is also what probably creates a big barrier because the, some of your friends have asked me this. So why aren't other guys rushing into this business? If you guys are saying it's so good, but they will have to spend those 35 years that we spent. And maybe the, today they'll catch it up in 10, 15 years, but nothing less than that. Correct. And then we have to move forward. So it's that moat that we created that is going to help us with, with our investment in technology, our commitment, which never wavered. You know, even in our toughest time, we never reduce our R&D space. Never. Mm. That's that's great to hear. So I I'll start taking questions, and I have two three questions already that people have asked. So you know, I think this compressed biogas opportunity uh, that you know government talked about, and you know they put in huge numbers in there. What are what's your take on that? Where are you on that journey? So I think. At a universal level, the figures put up by government are correct. 5,000 plants, if you do put up 5,000 plants, is there a feedstock? Yes. Is there a market for CBG? Yes. Uh, is there a, does that mean that nearly 1,75,000 crore of investment has to walk in? Yes. All of those are things. What has to happen from now onwards as we move forward? We saw that ethanol, what happened the last two years with this whole ecosystem creation and where are we today? CB started a little late. It was more nascent in nature. Uh, it, it calls for a new infrastructure creation, and that's the big uh, big challenge. Because we need to create a dispen dispensing ecosystem uh, where you can actually sell the gas. We, don't, we are not a gas economy, we are a liquid economy in the country. Right. Now, there's a lot of push coming with all the CGD networks being built, the gas retailing, the, uh, the companies that are uh, putting out vehicles that run on gas. So I think that is increasing the high price of liquid fuels. Yeah, uh, and all of that, and and above all, absolutely stupendous performance of gas vehicles. They're far superior in, in performance to any liquid performance in liquid uh, vehicles. So I think if you combine all of this, the ecosystem is just in a nascent stage and is building up. As it starts to build up and comes to some stage, you will see this economy also take place. We, have, we do not have, nobody in the world has this system anywhere. It's a very ambitious, absolutely bold and innovative program from the government. So we have to see, and we are we are very keenly working with them. As we speak, I was about two weeks ago, I was in Muzaffar Nagar where we had commissioned our first plant of CPG of industrial scale of that size. And I was very happy to go to the pump which was selling CBG. And I talked to the people who were buying CBG. There were 20 vehicle long line. Uh, there were two kind of people, those who were passing through, but there were also guys who were in Muzaffar Nagar local. And they said, this is wonder fuel. That's the word they use. This is wonder fuel. And how does the wonder fuel come about? He said, sir, ye meri gaadi mein ye bharta to ye dehradun ke upar jane ke liye, jo mujhe river jane ke liye, upar uh, chadna pata hai, wo bhoat AC chala ke, AC chalu rehta hai, aur phir bhi chad jata hai. Par agar liquid mein gaya, to nahi chad sakti, AC band karna pata hai. So, it's a, right. they don't measure, but this is very fundamental, it's a good fuel, this is cheap, this is environmental friendly, but the ecosystem has to develop over a period of time. From the vehicle side, from the uh, retailing or the dispensing side, as well as from the production side. And I think it's a, it's a bit of a graduate because it's a startup, maybe some four or five illustrations have to happen. The first case taught us a lot of things when we're putting the first case um, in UP that I'm talking about. 
those lessons that we learned, we'll be able to implement on second and on the third and so on. So I think uh, right now we're building four very crucial plans for these four are in the four different feedstocks, four key feedstocks in the economy, which will drive 85% of the market for CBG production. So economy is under development. The ecosystem is under development. Probably in about 18, 24 months time when we meet again, maybe we'll be able to see that. Sure. Another question was on this biomass base for hydrogen. Are you participating in this or, you know, is there an opportunity and that will you be participating in this? Yes, these are early days for the hydrogen economy, but obviously hydrogen is a very promising fuel. It is the most promising energy carrier known to mankind. So from that perspective, yes, uh, we, we, we will talk about it when time comes, but these are very, very early days. Uh, Biohydrogen will be a definitive route, uh, green hydrogen as it is called. We are uh, we are uh, in the process of understanding what it means, what it entails, how do we go about it. Uh, now, it, it has its own challenges whether you produce hydrogen on board of the vehicle or you produce it off board and then just uh, put a tank there. But depending on the type of vehicle, there are many dimensions that have to be solved. But it's obviously you can spike uh, uh, or you can mix uh, hydrogen into the CBG and that becomes a very potent fuel because uh, it has a very high calorific value. There are many dimensions that will emerge on hydrogen. Very exciting space, still, uh, um, but it is still further out in the future. But definitely a very promising uh, fuel. Sure. And one other question is on the water situation. Given the water situation in India, and you know, sugar is a very high water-consuming uh, crop. What does that you know? Is that a huge challenge going forward? Can, that can happen for ethanol. <laughs> So Sanjeev, I have two-fold answer to that. One is, what does a farmer produce? He has to produce sugar cane. If he does not till for sugar cane, he'll produce something else. But he has to produce some or the other crop for his livelihood, right? And that, there is no crop known to mankind which does not consume water. Let's put it like that. So, so that's number one. <clears throat> but moving on from there, what can I do as a technology group? Understanding that water is an important uh, dimension. And let me give some figures that will probably help you to understand what, what we are doing as a company. So in the ethanol production, uh, we had a techno, the norm was 11 liters of water per liter of ethanol. That was the norm. Okay. We have developed technology, we have deployed it on the ground, it is in the commercial form and running at 2.5 liters a liter, from 11 to 2.5. A big shift, right? Right. We are very focused as a company on reducing the water footprint in areas that I can influence. Right. And I think that's the contribution that we can make uh, to the overall cause, because I think what we have to see, we have to see the whole, uh, if, if the water dimension should not be seen in a unique thing saying, okay, in the field, I put so much of water. Because we have to see the full chain uh, water efficacy and see how uh, that uh, equation pans out vis-a-vis -vis the alternative. And that is equally uh, important uh, that we also map uh, the alternative part. For example, right now we are working on a technology uh, which we have sort of um, now engineered and ready with, which will, which from a CBG plant will recover 80% of the water and push fresh water out uh, back to the sugarcane field, okay, in, in, in sugar waste, sugary, uh, in a pressment based plant. So we can do this uh, in different forms. So uh, maybe, and I, I always see is that it is not about. I don't want, so for example, you can say, you know, you can be very environmentally friendly if you don't use air conditioning or heating. Well, if you're in a very cold country and you don't use heating, you're not going to survive. So I don't think it is about switching off things. It is about doing them in a responsible way. And that is where, that's the way we are approaching this, that we need to develop technology that is very responsible, that is very sustainable, and that drives positive uh, humanity development. And that's what we are focused on. Sure. So one other question is that assuming huge orders come your way, what would be your execution capability to execute in terms of revenue? And is there a number, overall number that you know beyond which you can't go? Is there you know some challenges on that or your you know how does that how is your capacity looking like? Sanjeev, as we say in India, for huge orders coming our way. Thank you so much for that wish. Uh, having said that, I think what is important is uh, 
we have to understand that we are not going to put any restrictions on ourselves to execute. That is not the way we will approach our business. We are approaching our business by saying, how do I become, how do I improve my capability and capacity both simultaneously to execute higher volume of business? Right. We already have a view of the way market is unfolding. We already have a view of what technological solutions are required. We also have to, we are also understanding what other technologies can do for us. For example, what can IT do for me to make me more productive? Right. Yeah. How can it help me drive standardization programs in engineering? How can it help me drive variety reduction program? How can it integrate information flow in the organization? There are many dimensions to it. Uh, how do I help? How does it help my customers to improve their operations? So there, it, it starts all the way from customer all the way to our last operation in our organization. So how do we use the interface of uh, IT and AI as it will unfold to improve productivity in our operations, to drive um, higher throughput? To improve uh, our response times, and I think that's that's where we are. Number one, number two, um, I, I'm not seeing a, a situation that tomorrow two zeros will get added in one year to our turnover. That is not happening, right? Uh, I mean, that kind of growth is not seen. And in one year time, we'll have two zeros added to the back of our sales. That's not. There is a growth, but the growth also has dimension to it, right? And we are very clear, clear whether it is in form of our readiness from our. Uh, workshops from our uh, vendor base that we are very focused. We've we been working at for last almost nine months now to dramatically expand our uh, vendor dedicated vendor base so that we are able to uh, manage the improve uh, increased workload. Uh, we are augmenting our engineering resources. We are augmenting the role of technology uh, as we continue to invest uh, into the new technology as well. So I am not worried about. That's not what gives me. Uh, very some or sleepless nights. I'm very comfortable right now in our ability to execute. We already demonstrated in the, the last quarter of the last financial year, and if you, if you take that multiplier, we've already shown that we can uh, improve uh, uh, two and a half times and no without blinking an eyelid. So we are very we are very conscious about uh, what is required. We are partnering with our vendors. Uh, we are uh, having dialogue with them to see how volumes will go up. We are developing dedicated vendor bases closer to our customers. We are augmenting our execution capabilities. I'm not worried about uh, executing the contracts at all. I mean, in the sense, yes, this is an area that we are focusing on, but I'm not worried about it. Great. Uh, okay. Uh, another question is at the current level of uh, fuel price, you know, close to 100, you know, is there a pump? Is it saving a lot of money by, you know, blending maybe 10% or 15%? Or how, how does it work? No, so the pump doesn't blend. The blending is done by the all marketing companies. Right. So the price, price that we pay at the pump, say for example, today in Maharashtra, probably you, depending on where you are, you probably have 90% petrol and 10% ethanol. Mm. But you go to Assam, it's 100% petrol. Right. So there is no blending taking place uh, there today, right? Or very, very, very small, uh, relatively speaking. But um, so from the perspective of a retailer of a, or a petrol pump, it doesn't make a difference. It is the combined price package that comes your way. Uh, these are also differently taxed commodities. So all those adjustments, the oil marketing companies do uh, uh, in, in accordance with the laws. And so it doesn't matter to the, uh, to the pump owners. Sure. Okay. So going back to, there is also a question on, uh, sorry, there's a follow up on this. So. For oil marketing companies, there a benefit? See, it's like this. This is the law of the country, right? That we want 20% blending. So please blend. Hmm. We have BS6 vehicle now. Uh, uh, this is law of the land. BS6 vehicles are more expensive than BS4 vehicles. But law of the land says that you shall not fly a vehicle which is not BS6, no new vehicle. You will not sell a new vehicle which is not BS6. So you have to make it happen. So there are... So it's, it's to be compliant with the law that they will have to blend the... Uh, and then they arrive at a, at a price that I and you will pay at the pump. Right. It, it is a matter of being compliant with the law and the directive. Okay. So, in terms of competition, uh, so going back to the question, so I have heard you speak somewhere before that you know you actually don't have a full competition for everything that you do. You have competition, but there is a question on competition. So maybe if you can address that, who is yeah. really your competition? Who is my competition? But <laughs> it depends on which business we are looking at, right? Very clearly because we are into, so for example, if it is zero liquid discharge business, 
then we compete with like say Fermax and Ion Exchange. What can we will if it is uh, our uh, chemical process and equipment and systems business? Then there are times when LMT is competing with us. There are times lots of multilateral companies that that compete with us. If we are onto a second generation ethanol, all competition is multinational. There is no Indian competition. If it is uh, domestic uh, ethanol for first generation technology, well, there are some small companies like Excel and uh, a couple of others uh, who are trying to, uh, who are also offering their solutions in the field. If I go to America, I compete with ICN. If I go to uh, Europe, I com compete again. So depend. And when I made the statement, what I meant was we have a suite of uh, or a pearls of uh, technologies to offer. For every technology, there is some competition, which is good according to me, because otherwise uh, there is not enough market. So, so which is a good driving force for people that also keeps us on our toes and them on their toes and ultimately the consumer benefits. But overall, I think uh, depending on which segment of market or which geography you operate in, there are different competitions. Right. Okay. Another question is that in terms of technology, are you, is your, all your plants like that you create are capable for all feedstock or, you know, you have capability for everything? Well, do we have capability? The answer is yes, we have capability for a very large variety of feedstock. You know, if you come to our R&D center one of these days, I can show you fingerprinting of over 900 uh, uh, different samples uh, of uh, feedstock that we have had. There are, uh, there are microbial foot, uh, footprints that we are creating under a very special program in Government of India. So uh, for us, it's, it's one as capability. From a customer's perspective, when they set up a plant, they will have, they can't, they don't want to say any feedstock in the world because that makes the plant very expensive. So they will obviously have to choose the feedstock that they have access to and what they would like to use. And if they specify that to me, I can build a plant. Sure. So I'll take a last question. Uh, so this is on uh, CBG opportunity. How are you placed in that CBG opportunity if it actually the way Government is talking about it, even if it happens over next, you know, five, 10 years. How are you placed? Like, what are you doing about it? Yeah, so very clearly, this is a big opportunity that we also uh, are very excited about. Uh, so we are participating uh, to our best uh, abilities right now. As I was mentioning earlier, uh, in dialoguing for ecosystem creation, in creating the first few references in the country, as I was mentioning, we are going to commission four plants by the end of this financial year. On different feedstock, first one is already commissioned near Buzza for another uh, in UP. Uh, we'll be commissioning one in South of India, one in West of India. There's another one in UP that will come up for HPCA that we announced some time ago on Rice Pro. So we are very clearly understanding what it takes. And since this is very new, so on the supply chain, what are the dimensions? On the on the demand side, what are the dimensions? How do we equate the board? How do we balance it out? What are the technology issues? I think we are uh, very clearly we are committed and we have built a plant, a demonstration plant inside our R&D where we are trying different feedstocks to understand the behaviors and their yields and what it takes and what it does not take. It's a microbial process. Um, so it takes a lot of knowledge. Three knowledges that we combine, which is what makes us unique. One is deep understanding of microbiology, which is what half of our R&D is all about. Very, very deep understanding of thermal engineering and integration because that's what we do uh, for living. And third is uh, about um, energy integration capability of ours. So combined with all these three, we are in a position to bring out a solution, which is at least, if not more, 30% better uh, yield compared to the next guy in the business. So that is what is making us stand apart. We are very clear. We are in that business to be at the pole position and we have no intention to give it up. Right. And who would be competition here in this area? So right now uh, we don't see, uh, we see some couple of German companies, one company from Holland, uh, a couple of them from Germany who are now uh, beginning to uh, trying to find feet. But uh, this is very nascent right now. So I think these are early days, maybe as we go forward and, and some basic ecosystem develop, we'll see some more uh, players also working. Uh, what we are very, very uh, confident about though is by that time, we would have established a deep understanding of what is required to be done and how. So not only the know-how, but also the know-why, and that is what we make us stand up. Right. Great, Shijit, thank you very much for this session and really wishing you all the best. And I hope, you know, all your dreams come true. You have a huge runway and, you know, wishing you guys all the very best. Thank you. Thank you, Sanjay, for your good wishes and thank you for having me here today.
Okay, and thank you everyone for participating in this one. Uh, and we'll, this, as he said, this is the first one. We'll do more of these. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. So I'm running along. I've got another meeting to go to. So thank you so sure. much. Okay, bye.